One question we occasionally get asked on the Loco crew is when a train gets to either Alton or Alford, what happens? Does it stay on and push us all the way back? Of course, the answer is no, it runs round. But if you look at it from a modern perspective, that's actually quite a reasonable question. These days, if a train gets to, say, Waterloo, the driver just gets out of one end, walks down to the far end of the train, keys in and off they go. It's clearly a modern invention. Or is it? Yes, believe it or not, this modern invention was actually found in the early 20th century. And in today's episode, we're here at the South Devon Railway to see just how it works. This is going to be a good episode. to the early days of railways and branch lines. This will be the setup you normally have. You have a loco and a couple of coaches running up and down. However, there was an issue. When they got to the far end, the locomotive, like you see on most heritage railways, they would have to uncouple, run round, couple on and go. So that meant providing a quick and efficient service did have some limitations. The idea of having some sort of coach and locomotive embodiment in one came around in the early 20th century when the auto or steam rail cars were invented. These were essentially a coach with a power unit built into it. The idea being, you have one single retain unit, you could go down to the far end of a line, driver could just change ends to the far end of a coach and drive back again. This revolutionized the railway because you could find a quick and efficient service. Bear in mind, they were trying to compete with tramways at the time. However, there were a few limitations. The first one was capacity. They could have a maximum of two coaches. You'd have a driver unit and a trailer to go with. Another limitation was, well, when we see locomotives today, if an engine fails, you just take it off, you could chop in another one if you're really fortunate. However, the power unit being built into the coach, if there's any issues, well, there goes your service. Equally, when it's taken out for maintenance, you've got a lot of work to do. Heavy maintenance, you could be finding yourself taking apart the coach to get to where you need to be. You've had an engineer walking through the passenger compartment, making it grubby, compared to the current arrangement where a locomotive, the dirty bits were kept separate from the clean parts, which were the passenger coaches. So realistically, they needed to come up with some way of trying to get the best of both worlds. Somehow keep a locomotive and coach separate from each other, but still have the ability to drive from one end. And that's where auto trains or push pull came in. At the moment, we're driving with the locomotive hauling, so driver and fireman are working normally, and this is an ideal opportunity. Our driver today is Rodney, he's a traction inspector here, acting as our driver, and our fireman today is Ben, who is also a driver, which you'll find out why when we get to the other end. So, without further ado, let's change ends and see how this all works. So here we are, in the coach, on our way back to Buckfast Lee. Now there are a few challenges when it comes to water coaches. Namely, Rodney has actually got less control than he would do if he was in the locomotive. He can't from here adjust to the reverser, so the engine's gearbox controlling forwards or backwards, and he also can't blow up the brake. He's got three main controls. He's got a handbrake for the coach, hardly ever gets used except when stabling. He can apply the brake and he can open and shut the regulator. When he moves this handle, it goes down to a crankshaft, down towards the locomotive, and actually physically moves the regulator up and down in the cab. They communicate using a system of bells between the driver and fireman. It is one bell for opening and shutting the regulator, it is two bells for the fireman to blow off the brake, and three bells is to stop. So Rodney, from a practicality point of view, obviously you can't control the reverser, you can't blow off the brake. 
What are some of the challenges that you face and why does Ben need to be a driver to be a fireman here? Uh, because the, an auto fireman is virtually driving the engine. Um, as you said earlier, um, he, not only does he look after the boiler, uh, in as much as he's got to maintain the fire, he's got to maintain the boiler water level, and he's got to maintain the steam pressure, um, he's also responsible for uh, blowing off or releasing and maintaining uh, the vacuum brake on the train. And he's also responsibility, well, it's basically for the, the safe conduct of the locomotive. Added to that, as you've seen at Staverton, uh, where we've got a single line crossing point, he's also responsible for collecting and exchanging the token. So an auto fireman has got to be an auto uh, fireman and an auto driver, really. Um, and luckily we've got Ben at the back there. He's one of our most competent drivers. So um, I know at the front here I'm in good hands. Um, as you said, the, the controls are somewhat limited up the front. I've got the regulator and I've, I'm able to apply the brake but not release it. But the, 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 the strength of the union is the fact that I've got that bell. So if I need to come to a stand, I just give him three on the, on the bell. Um, and he, if, if I'm, indeed I'm unable to, I can't think why I wouldn't be able to. But if I can't bring the train to a stand, he can do it. So we've got absolute communication. And the fact that we use it all the time, um, that proves continuity that everything is still working. So it's an, an archaic way of working, but a safe way of working. On the line of communication, when you're in the cab driving normally, you can see the pressure, you can see the water level, you can see if the fireman's struggling, but the only gauges you have here are speed and brake. So how can you tell if the fireman's struggling, or is there a case if you just sort of grind to a halt and that's when you find out? Um, if, if the fireman was struggling, um, as I said, um, especially if he was struggling in a manner that is likely to compromise the water level, or well, most importantly, compromise the water level in the boiler, um, not only has he got communication with me to enable me to bring the train to a stand, he's got a facility on the locomotive to bring the train to a stand himself. As I say, rather than compromise the safety of the locomotive, we will always bring the train to a stand, um, sort out what the problem is, and then get underway again. So there's the, we are both able, um, in our different roles and at different ends of the train, uh, to bring it to a stand at a second's notice. It's the best job on the railway. Um, it's a, a, a job which is highly sought after because normally when we do four trips on the branch, um, if you think about it, we actually get in between to couple and uncouple 16 times a shift. And the hard work is not really so much the firing, it's the coupling and uncoupling, the constant coupling and uncoupling. So if you're on an auto train, you couple it up once, and then you do your four trips and you uncouple it and that's it. It's a, it's a very pleasant way of working. It does sound like the high life now you mention it like that. <laughs> it is. And it's, um, it's also it's, uh, quite a challenge really because of the, the fact that it all goes through rods and linkages. It's getting the feel of it, actually getting the feel of how it's all working. As I say, it's a very pleasant way of working and it's, it's quintessential to the Great Western branch line of the West Country. So when we're doing this, we really are recreate, recreating how the Ashburton branch used to be. Now the rail motor has also had a, quite an interesting feature. As I mentioned earlier, the rail motor was designed for essentially to compete with tramways and they could pick off passengers on the ground. You wouldn't need this bespoke infrastructure like platforms. So they put in steps in the middle of the coach and that way you could pick up people from the ground and that got carried over into the auto trains. Now you may be wondering, said, you may say to yourself, well, this is lovely and all, but this is a great Western. What does it have to do with the water coast line? Well, push ball of this technology was not limited to the West Country. London South Western also used it as well. They had a slight variation however. Instead of a mechanical linkage to drive the regulator, they used compressed air, a pneumatic system. On the local where the crankshaft would normally be, you'd have a pneumatic piston. So the driver would control air to that piston and that would be attached to a rod, that would be the thing that moves your regulator. Now this would save a lot of strain, physical strain that is, moving those heavy levers. However, the controllability of that regulator was a bit more of a challenge to, well, succeed at. So it wasn't unheard of for the firemen to essentially drive with the regulator and the driver would do the braking and stop them if necessary. That's why when you see things like the M7s, they have a Westinghouse pump. A lot of people think it's for the air braking system like you see on modern mainline locomotives, but in reality, it was for this push-pull system. 
steam push pull would not last forever. They would eventually be replaced by the diesel multiple units, which will then go on to the electric multiple units, down to the modern trains that we see today. So, when your train pulls into Waterloo and the driver changes ends, this is how it started. So there you are, the technology did always exist for a locomotive to stay on one end of the coach and carry on. Ideal for branch lines. Now at this point, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of the team here at the South Devon Railway. Believe me or not, they have helped us out with this video more than you could possibly think. The best example is that. That train was not supposed to be running today. It was supposed to be a diesel multiple unit and after they found out that we wanted to do something on push pull and auto trains, they put this on specially for us. So I genuinely cannot thank them enough. I'd also like to say a huge thanks to Will, who's currently standing behind the camera, uh, grinning now. <laughs> because in the week leading up to this, I came down for a little recce and he was absolutely fantastic, showing us around good filming points. And in return, we would get some footage for them as well, just to say thank you. So this sort of working together in Heritage Railways happens more than you think. It's a lot behind the scenes and it's some things that you do see. Think of last minute gala visitors, hiring locomotives. We're all in it for the same game, really. And it's stuff like this that makes me absolutely love my role. So folks, thank you so much for watching. Thank you to Will, Rodney, Ben, and everyone here at South Devon Railway. It's been a fantastic weekend and yeah, something you don't see every day. We'll see you next time. <laughs>